The 2019 Goalkeepers Reports released on Tuesday by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has said that many low- and middle-income countries are struggling to achieve the SDGs due to gender and ge geographical inequalities in many of the regions. According to that report, many developing countries like Nigeria are still lagging behind in achieving these SDG goals. And still in the studio, Obi Ajebo, she is a legal practitioner, still with us. Uh, thank you for joining us, Obi. Mm -hmm. Now, Bill literally went in on details as to why, and he didn't mince words, we will not he said it categorically that we will not be able to achieve the SDGs in education and in health. Now, um, yeah, he talks about the fact that there's been impressive growth in some places, but in Nigeria, uh, he talks about the fact that we have issues of inequality uh, and how geography and gender stacks the deck for and against us. Um, according to that report, many developing countries like Nigeria are lagging behind in terms of um, gender, gender inequality. Uh, it said the percentage of people in Nigeria's region suffering from in, uh, inequities based on geographical and gen gender barriers are still very high. Now, without even going too far, in Nigeria, the girl-child education is pretty low. But it's improving. Well, as at last year, 15 million plus children, or 13, were out of school. 80% of those children who were out of school were girls. And one would think that in the 21st century, we would be very akin to sending every child to school, whether male or female. But here we are, still making the list for negative inequities, such as lack of education for the girl child. I'm just wondering, I mean, you're a lawyer, you're in, you're in this country. There are people who don't see a girl child as a, a child, you know, it's, that's a problem. So why spend money on the a girl child? You need a man. Uh, that's the, as of two, 2017, or is it 2018, traditionally an, an Igbo woman cannot inherit. It only took UKG and UKG, just 2017 or 2018, to change that, the Supreme Court landmark decision that women have a right to inherit. This is 21st century, 2018, an Igbo woman. And it's still in some places, they still, it, it, can you imagine taking your uncles to court over inheritance? which is very nasty. It won't, it won't happen because my place, you have the right to... No, in, in the East, I'm talking on the East. So you, have to, so you literally have to take them to court? To court to get your right. I know how court system, it's messy. And it can drag on for so long. And that is just inheritance. Some people still see women as only good for marriage. Hence, a lot of domestic violence cases because they'll, they'll tell them, uh, it's your husband, keep... keep um, Stay there, manage, pray, do this, do this, until they kill the woman. That is it. And then also some women, the, some people don't value women. You have people that have six, seven women, and they drive away the mother and the children because they feel a woman is not a child. And these inequities mm -hmm. don't stop there at home. It goes to the workplace. And it is also captured in this report mm -hmm. where women are passed over uh, this, I'm beginning to sound like a feminist, which I'm not. Mm -hmm. But women are passed over, even when they're qualified for the job, and given to men, no matter how hard working. That is they are. why. That is why women that are on top are hard, because they've had to work twice as much and prove. And then, first of all, they have to, f um, first of all, get rid of uh, a woman. A woman sleeps before she attains. Do you understand all this thing about? Yeah, you slept your way up. You slept your way kind of and <laughs> all those things. So when they get there, they are very hard mm -hmm. and they're impassionate about things. Let's talk about health now. Um, that report has talked about the gaps. Let's look at the gaps. He says, in that report, it shows that Nigeria and other sub-Saharan countries are not expected to achieve SDG targets for both child mortality and education. Let's look at our health care facilities. When I was a child, a health post was a few meters away from yeah. 
every, you know, it was a few meters away from every home. It wasn't so far. Mm -hmm. But those have seemed to disappear. I don't know if they're reappearing, but the health post, are not, and even if you see them, they're empty. There are no doctors. There might just be one nurse. And then we have maternal mortality rates spiking through the roof. And then we also have the issue of um, doctors migrating to other parts of the country because of brain drain. Let's look at that. Um, first of all, I can only talk about Lagos because I've lived all my life in Lagos. About four or five years ago, Lagos decided to revamp most of its health centers because the, the, what we need are health centers in within kilometers of your house so that anything any problem you have you go to you go there and go and they have rev they revamped the Bado Ray that is very working excellently they've revamped Elegushi and they've, re they've not revamped Ibu Ibu Efo, but uh, those two are modern you have everything occasionally when I don't feel like going to my doctor I go to the health center because this the I feel better doctors are there because you no know, government workers are well trained mm -hmm. so I go to the health center and I'm, I must say I'm very very pleased I don't know about Anambra my home state because I, I, I haven't I don't go there regularly but now also something to do with child mortality is these people reading the Bible upside down that um, we should give birth like a Hebrew woman Woman, you need caesarean. Ah, no. Uh, uh, that means I'm not a woman. But then they're also not, apart from mm. the traditional belief mm. systems, we also have religion. Mm. So the issues of blood transfusion, a person might be actually bleeding from childbirth, mm. a person might lose, um, and then it's losing blood. And the husband says, well, it's against our religion. You cannot in any way you know, do blood transfusion. How do we deal with that? There are cases now that says that when you have to think about life, it, it, this, the, the case in particular, I've forgotten the, the, the name of the case, but it was decided about two years ago when a, a father refused a child uh, blood transfusion and the doctor now took it upon himself to do that blood transfusion and they took it to court. And the, and, the, and the court said that the doctor was right in what he was doing because it's his duty to save life. And I think that that locus should uh, come to the one because I don't understand why somebody will bleed to death because of your bad interpretation of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm. So now there's something very intriguing in this report. The report says that very few developing countries are projected to meet this health and education SDGs. It is projecting that many of these countries will not even meet that target by 2050. So there is no hope in the nearest future, even the farthest of mm. futures. Now, this is not because they are not making efforts in reducing child mortality or improving health care services and education, but because there are lots of marginalized districts not covered within the country. Nearly two thirds of children in low and middle income countries live in districts that at the current rate of progress, won't reach the SD, SDD ta child target by 2020. Now, one third of these children live in districts that won't even be reached. Have so let's been, talk about even immunization. Have you been to Ajegunle? No. Go to Ajegunle. There's a, there's a, um, there's a slum, my ch church ministers to Ajakonde. When people are coming out of there, my heart bleeds. They are like worms, you know, ants coming out. They are pumping out. And what conditions do they live in? They live in Babu hearts and it's in the heart of Jakonde. Wow. Now, they are not on government's radar. So how can government cater for them? Except when, because of a church outreach, they have issues, they call a pastor, that the pastor now sent somebody to take them to hospital. But if that church outreach was not there, do you know what would have, what would be there? So whatever happened to mapping, I mean, let's not even talk about population census because we don't know what year that is going mm -hmm. to ever happen. And then we don't know when the figures are going to be authentic ever population because census, they're questionable. Population census is a tool to propagate one, se one section of the, of the country. Well, well, but, but you see, the, the reason I'm sure that those of us who know about population mm -hmm. census, it's so that it can aid development. You cannot bring development to people or know what people need if you don't know how many they are or where they even are. Yes, and that is why a certain place prefers to up their own 
figures to show that they need more of those resources. But even in that, mm. there are still places that are not covered. There is no mapping, so they don't have access to clean water. I was in Abuja five years ago, mm. and I, re I discovered that there was a community just before the FCT that has no access to drinking water. And the water they drink is terrible from a stream. And they have a member representing them, that community. So is it even about the radius, or is it just that we don't have records, or we don't care about We don't about have these records. records, and the population is just expanding, and we don't have, normally we should have a 20-year plan. There was a time Nigeria used to have a 10-year plan, a 20-year plan, and they used to work towards it. But now all that has gone to the wind. So we have no plan whatsoever? We don't have any plan. Just this government comes, starts this project, the next government comes, cancels what this government is doing and does this program. And it is the, the ordinary citizens that need help that are the ones that are suffering this. And they are the ones we should be looking out of because out of our 200 million, they are almost 100 million. Let's look at Adore Kitty mm -hmm. as a case study. Using Nigeria, the report said that people living in Adore Kitty, in Akiti State, are likely to have better access to education and health care facilities than people in Gariki. Jigawa State. It also says that for Nigeria to have encouraging data, the government needs to strategically focus on the development of health and education sector in the underdeveloped districts. But you just made mention of a jakonde, which is in which is under Ekpe. Mm. So no, a jakonde is um, um, Etiosa. Etiosa, I'm mm. sorry, under Etiosa. Mm. And this is, this, this is the way you think that everybody who lives here is, you know, of a certain class. But then you have those slums. Who's to tell government how to do this? Because, yes, this, this has come out. I'm waiting for government to, I'm, I'm sure that government is going to give a response. But after the response, who goes into these districts and makes a proper finding and brings it back to the table? Recently, the economic team has been disbanded. And um, former central bank governor is now put together in some team to mm. take over from the, the, the vice president. Wani. Yes. Who's going to bring that report to the table if we truly are here to serve the people of Nigeria? First of all, every locality should have a member of reps um, um, accountable to them. And we should, it is time we now started taking these people up and making them accountable. A member of reps, I saw one very, very funny, one very interesting one. A member of reps, I think in Ocean State or whatnot, came to his community and he was playing draft with them. And from playing draft with them, he was interacting with them. And some of them that have police cases, he will come, send a lawyer to them, and bail them out. And this. That, is, that is the sort of representation we want. We don't want you just to go to Abuja. We want you to be with us, talk to us, interact with us, know where we are aching, so that you can help to bring things in. That's the first step, because they are representing us. Then the second step is the commissioners. God, let us not have commissioners that will just be sitting at the table. We should have commissioners that move around. Commissioners, like when Fashola was governor, he used to move around at night to check things out. We should go back to that system because people must have, for this, for this nation not to boil, we must have start taking steps that will impact on the ordinary man. All right, so this report, just for the benefit of those who are watching, mm. is not to make Nigeria look bad. It is to educate people on where there are gaps and where the progress is and what we need to do to try and achieve these goals. And I asked this question earlier on. Will we as a country take this report and do anything with it? Or do we always quickly issue out... Um, you know, yes. Mm. And then we move on to the next issue. With the, with the government of the day, do we see that actually happening? Well, I, I, looking at the government of the day, uh, what will come to my mind is no. But being that I'm an optimistic person, I would say yes. Maybe the, has, maybe the Speaker of the House of Reps, maybe somebody can get across to him and tell him, look, this is what we want. Talk to these people. We need to start talking to these people to make it a change. What about us, the people? Because 
education is also part of the problem. Mm. Who's going to be reorienting the minds of people? Where's the orientation going to take place? Who's going to educate the people on this so that the people can in turn ask governments to be responsible to them? You because see, the average person in that slum has no idea about this report. The journalist may, the accountant may, the economist may, the politician might. But who tells the people who need this help about this so that they can demand, place a demand on First the people all, that they have elected? Remember I always say, put square pegs in square, hole, in square holes. Now we have a national orientation agency. Now the national orientation agency should be able to be letting out um, things on, you know, people don't know that there's free education in Lagos until I, I wanted to put somebody in school. And I found out that this, this, you, you can go to school in Lagos and not pay, but you pay for your uniform and you pay for some other things. It's very small, small things. So you find children that are on the streets and nobody knows. So I had to tell some friends, look, with about 40,000, 50,000 a term, you can train a child. Let's do that, let's do that, you know? So, but not, I, I just discovered that because I stumbled upon it because I wanted to do something. Now, it is not my duty to do that. It is the duty of the National Orientation Agency to say there's free education, go to school. There's free food uh, feeding, go to school. Just go, if you don't have slippers, maybe we can speak to government to provide shoes. There is the National Orientation Agency to, to tell people now that elections are not there, go and register and collect your cards. Yeah. Do these things. But they are not doing it. Only time they do it is when they, is when they wake up is six months to the election, then they start making noise. Well, uh, I'm hoping with all sense of... Uh, I'm hoping that the presidency and the new economic team, I don't know what they're called right now, would take a look at this holistically and do the needful. I'm hoping that all the things that we've talked about today will be take, pick it, picked up and you know, dealt with. You see, until we now take criticisms as a spur for you to act well, then we are not going anywhere. If we take criticisms as an attack, then we will not go anywhere. But when we take criticisms as, oh, we can do it better this way, then we move on as a nation. Thank you very much. Obi Ajebo is a lawyer. Thank you so much for speaking with us. We'll take a short break. And of course, we'll be looking at uh, Christian Aid as they unveil new seven years strategy for displaced persons in Nigeria. When I return, I'll give you my take. The Nigeria of our dream, the Nigeria we have envisioned in seven years, is impossible for only Christian Aid to achieve it. And that's why today we are going public with it. And by going public, we mean that we are letting it out in the open to say this is our intention. This is what we want to do. We've come a long way in Nigeria, operating since 2003. We started out with a vision called transforming hope into action. That vision led us into another vision which we call partnership for change. Today, we are launching a new strategy building up on the two different strategies we've actually uh, lived in Nigeria, building on those two different strategies over the last few years, today we're launching a strategy called Standing Together, and this means a lot. When we stand together, we walk together, we live together, and we die together. We need to die together in Nigeria to make Nigeria a better place. And when we walk, uh, walk together and stand together, we stand together to fight injustice. We stand together to promote the dignity of human person. We stand together to promote equity. We stand together to love together. If you think that poverty cannot be eradicated, all your programming, your thoughts and behavior will be towards that line. But if you believe that poverty can be eradicated, then you will do everything 
that is necessary to eradicate poverty. We know that we are living at a time where we have the greatest amount of resources ever known in world history. The resources in the world today, if used judiciously, can eradicate poverty. But we have poverty because the wealth is concentrated in the hands of a few people. The population of Nigeria is almost 200 million. 90 million, over 90 million are living in extreme poverty. 46% of all Nigerians are living in extreme poverty. Over 46% in a country that for those of us like me who come from Zambia, we've always considered Nigeria to be the giant economy of Africa. We know the wealth that exists in this country. And yet I want to ask you the question, where is your outrage? Where is your outrage when your brothers and sisters are living in abject poverty? Where is your outrage when young girls are being given in early marriage, when they're supposed to be at school, enjoying their lives as young people growing up? Where is your outrage when there's female genital mutilation? Where is your outrage when women are being battered in their homes? Where is your outrage when there are no women at the decision-making space? Where is your outrage when you look at your brothers and sisters in Maiduguri and they are suffering without shelter, without access to land, without resources? It's time for my take. So, insecurity has become a sing-song in Nigeria right now. We keep talking and, you know, paying lip service to it, and it keeps growing it in lips and bound. And I'm not in any way trying to rubbish what our army or the soldiers are doing there in the Northeast. I'm not trying to rubbish the efforts of our policemen, but are we dealing squarely with this issue? It takes political will. It's not just the security officers, but then, of course, it is a collective responsibility of all our leaders across boards, states, local governments, and even at the federal level, to make sure that this insecurity thing becomes a thing of the past. Hey, we cannot make money as a country. We cannot attract investments, foreign investments, if we are seen as an insecure country. Now, the Bill and Belinda Gates Foundation have come up with a report saying that we may not be able to uh, reach our SDG goals for 2030, talk less of 2050. Why? Because our education is poor. Our healthcare system is dead, literally. And so our doctors are running away to other countries where they can actually get paid and they can do a great job. So you go to the UK and you see that the general practitioner, the, the GPs, are mostly Nigerians. You go to South Africa, they're mostly Nigerians. What are we doing to our dear country, Nigeria? And this goes to our presidency. It goes to our, our House of Assembly, our National Assembly. What are we doing to this great country? Are we mighty for nothing? Let's change the status quo. And it's going to be in our best interest. Let's do the right thing. I am Mary Cole. It's been Plus Politics. <laughs>